Welcome, good afternoon. I know I had told you guys that I wasn't going to come back until Thursday or Friday. But as most of my live streams have been kind of unexpected and spontaneous. And this one is provoked actually by me being irritated by something. Now, with a lot of stuff to do with my Mo One philosophy and my overall dating advice, I find myself having to repeat things, you know, multiple times, which is not a bad thing. And particularly on videos. Sometimes some things I've repeated dozens of times, some things I've repeated hundreds of times. And this is one of gonna be one of those things I have to repeat. And it's I've kind of alluded to it in at least two or three of my previous live streams over the last two weeks or so, but I'm gonna emphasize it again. Hold on one second. I got to pull up a graphic. Boom, 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 boom. Well, in the meantime, while I'm doing things on my computer, uh, yeah, I see Roni Rowan said this will be another, yeah, this is, this is definitely a, a little bit of my alter ego is going to be coming out on this one. It's going to be not a full angry rant. There's my ranting alter ego ramble. That's my ranting alter. Now, speaking of that, I had a follower just asked me yesterday. You know, I always talk about how I receive a lot of what I refer to as complicisms. Complicisms. Meaning someone will start off with a compliment to me, but then transition into essentially criticizing me. And one guy, he said, Alan, I've been following you on YouTube for at least three years. And he said, man, a lot of your videos I find are just, you know, fully packed with good knowledge, wisdom, insight, and advice. But he said, if I have one criticism of you, you seem a bit reactive. You seem a bit reactive, and I could have swore that part of BMO1 was not being reactive to, like, women's criticisms, insults, you know, negative opinions, et cetera. But you seem to feel compelled to respond to just about everyone who offers a negative critique of your Mo One approach and various aspects of your advice. Why is that? Why in your books do you tell guys essentially not to be reactive? But here on YouTube, you seem to be very reactive. And honestly, that was a fair question. I didn't get like offended by that question. It's a fair question. And since this guy said he's been following me for at least three years, that would go back to 2018. This guy knows who he is. You should know, because I, I haven't explained it in recent videos, but there was at least one video I did in 2017, and I want to say at least two videos I did in 2018, and maybe even one video I did in 2019. So I would say I did approximately four videos where I essentially answered that question. Here's a simple deal, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one video, one of those four videos was called some to the fact of does ARC secretly love his haters and critics? That was the title. It was either that title or a title very similar to that of the four videos I'm thinking of where I addressed this. I had one video that was called does ARC secretly love his haters and critics. And what I said in that video is that if I was just to do purely advice, oh what the, what the hell? I'm hearing, I'm hearing, <laughs> if you heard a voice, that was uh, actually, I must have had the lead attorneys, because he's doing a live stream today. I thought his was a little later, but uh, he's doing a live stream. So when you heard that voice that came up on my computer, that was actually, now speaking of lead attorney, yeah, I go jumping all over the place. You know, my wife gave me a criticism yesterday, a constructive criticism. She she rarely gives me too many critiques on my live streams, 
But even my wife says, she said, honey, <laughs> at least in the first third, first half of your, your live stream yesterday, you were kind of jumping all over the place. It was like, she said, I was doing one ramble digression, then I would jump to another ramble digression, then I jumped to another ramble digression, then I jumped to another ramble digression. And yeah, I do that from time to time. Uh, now, remember I mentioned the lead attorney? I was kind of complimenting his ability to get so many super chats without really talking about shit. If you listen to last uh, yesterday's live stream, well, he had somebody in his comment section that that made mention of that. It was, he was actually now I didn't go say it in a real harshly critical manner. I just more so express it as an observation. But this guy in his uh, comment section, he actually said it expressed it as a harsh criticism of the lead attorney. He basically, I'm slightly paraphrasing his words, but he was basically like, "Lead attorney, I like you, man." But your live stream the other day was total bullshit, man. You spent two hours talking about fluff. But yet you was collecting all this money. But you spent like the two hours, first two hours talking about just fluff. Now, I had said he spent the first hour and 15 minutes, essentially, just doing greetings and shout outs. I didn't know it was as long as two hours. But hey, man, from a business perspective, how can you hate on the lead attorney for that? Again, man, he cleared over a thousand dollars in like the first hour, hour and fifteen minutes, and he he hadn't even gotten into the topic yet. Um, see this when I jump around, I forget where I jump from. Okay, I mentioned my wife said I jumped around. Oh, I know what I was talking about. This guy criticized me. Yeah, I did a video where I basically said if I was only do purely like purely one hundred percent advice. Videos, videos that just sitting around giving my giving man advice, you wouldn't see me on YouTube. <laughs> real talk. And that's real, real, real talk. You wouldn't see me on YouTube. At maximum, you wouldn't see me at all on YouTube. At minimum, you would only see me about maybe five or six times a year. I wouldn't do YouTube. I said that in a video in 2017. I said that in at least two videos in 2018. And I said that in at least one video in 2019. I said, I wouldn't be on YouTube. Main reason I'm on YouTube in terms of most of my content is to refute invalid things said about my Mo One philosophy and other aspects of my advice. That's the main reason. You can say that's like at least 80 to 90% of the reason why I'm on YouTube is to refute invalid criticisms invalid arguments against my Mo One philosophy and anything related to my dating advice in general. That's the main reason I'm on YouTube. So in other words, to put it another way, if you took away 99% of my haters and critics and the only people who gravitated towards me was people who genuinely wanted advice from me, the only way you would be able to hear from me is on my Patreon page. That would be the only way you'd be able to hear from me is on my Patreon page. So let me see who I got in the chat room. I don't have many people. This is one of my smallest amounts, but it is. I just started. But man, yeah, I only got like 45 people in here. Okay, I see boy. I gotta put on my reading light. See, boy breezy. Say, yo, what's up? AT. My home girl, Deanna Barnes. That's my Gary, Indiana home girl. Adrian Bissett, Ronnie Rome. He already made a comment. One of my trusted uh, moderators, Iceberg S. Goku Black, man. I owe you an apology, Goku Black. I think I already gave you an apology. But there was one stream. Somebody said something I didn't like, and I was trying to block them, and I inadvertently block you from the chat room but you weren't the one who who said something crazy it was the it was someone who made a comment either right above you or right below you but i inadvertently blocked you but my i saw that my moderators handle it they ended up handling it and they unblocked you so yeah i didn't mean to block you that that one live stream i meant to block whoever 
posted something either right before you or right after you. Um, uh, Brandon, what's up, Brandon? Amari, Jeremy Warner, one of my trusted moderators. Thado, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Thado, it could be Thado. Thado, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, Dada Saints, he's become a regular in the chat room. And JR, what's happening? Finbar, one of my more intelligent and articulate uh, commenters. Well, I like to think uh, the vast majority of my commenters in my comment section are intelligent, articulate, and objective-minded. Anonymous says, as Anonymous says, I'm sick of these other dating coaches misleading people. Don't fall for their marketing and traps. ARC is the truth. I appreciate that because there are a lot of dating coach there's some other legitimate ones. I'm not going to call them all out by name, but I think most people know there's at least a, a, a certain number of dating coaches that I think are legitimate. But you got a lot of other dating coaches, man, out here in PUAs that are basically just selling you bullshit. They're selling you hype. They're selling you bullshit, which is what a lot of conventional PUAs did in the, in the, in the uh, mid to late 2000s you know, after the game came out. And that's why, again, that's why that website, where is it at again? PUA hate. That's why PUA hate existed before it got shut down because of the Elliot Roger murders. That's the main reason. That's the number one reason why PUA hate existed. Because you had a lot of PUAs and dating coaches basically selling invalid bullshit. They were selling invalid bullshit. I can honestly say, man, I never had a paid client of mine, a, per, a guy who paid for either one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face coaching, a Skype consultation, Zoom consultation, telephone consultation, or even an email consultation that later on said, I think Alan Roger Curry's advice is totally useless and invalid bullshit. I don't think I've literally, and I've been a dating coach for roughly 20 years, man. I don't think I've ever had a client say that about my stuff. Because number one, as I've mentioned before, I never, I never make guarantees or promises that I can't deliver on. That's one thing I never do. I never make guarantees, offer guarantees or promises that I can't deliver on. For example, I never promise or guarantee to turn a client of mine into some type of overnight ladies' man or overnight womanizer. I never, I never, ever promise that or guarantee that. I always say it's possible that a percentage of my clients could, figuratively speaking, in a matter of weeks or a few months, become some type of overnight ladies' man, overnight womanizer, because I've, I've seen it happen with a few guys. But I never promised that as a guarantee. So that's one thing that prevents me from being accused of selling bullshit. I don't, I don't, I don't make, I don't, I don't sell fantasies, man. Again, the, there's only two things I come close to guaranteeing with my clients. I've said this in a previous live stream. I'll say it again. I guarantee clients that if if I work with you, you'll never be friend zoned ever again. You'll never be friend zoned by a woman ever again. That's the number one promise I do usually make to clients. I say. If I work with you and you apply all of my advice, you will never become friend zoned by a woman ever again. Yeah, that's the main reason why I created my more one approach was not necessarily to get laid more, but was to prevent women from friend zoning me. If you know my backstory, that was my number one frustration around the time I started being more one was not so much that I just wasn't getting laid enough. My frustration was that I was getting, there was a lot of women who I thought was willing to give me some pussy, but really they was, they ended up friend zoning me. But it was really my fault for being indirect. And uh, another thing I say, if, if you follow all of my advice, I work with you, you'll never end up investing 
or wasting a significant amount of time and or money investing or wasting a significant amount of time and or money with women who are not genuinely interested in you. Um, Wiggy Will. Yeah, he said, he said, thank God for that. That's true, though. I, again, I said that on at least one video, if not two videos, since I've been on YouTube. I said my haters and critics are really the main reason I do YouTube videos. It, again, if you took away all of my haters and critics, 95 to 99% chance, I would only be doing Patreon exclusive videos. I would only be doing Patreon exclusive videos. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do like videos or even live streams for the general public. Yeah, most, not all, there's a few exceptions, but most of my videos, are, the main objective of them is to counter invalid critiques of one or more of my books and, and various aspects of my dating advice is to refute and counteract invalid shit said about me. Uh, my first super chat. I appreciate this. Joshua Walsh, $5. That's right. He said ARC is the GOAT. I appreciate that compliment. No free attention. Mo one. Rizzo, love from the UK. I appreciate that. ARC, did you catch Bernard's stream? For now, Mel, I'm going to say no comment, man. I'm going to say no comment. Joe Blass, what's happening? Yeah, I've seen this. I've seen this, Goku. <laughs> I've seen this. There's a lot of guys who are either in the manosphere or they're peripheral around the manosphere that instead of calling themselves a dating coach, they call themselves a social skills improvement coach or just simply a self-improvement coach. They don't call themselves specifically a dating coach. They call themselves either a social skills improvement coach or just generally a self-improvement coach. You know, I, I'll be honest, and I've mentioned this before, I've had some people who have criticized me for calling myself a dating coach. I've had some people that have criticized me for calling myself a dating coach. It wasn't in a real harsh manner, but like I can think of at least two guys, one was white and one was black, that actually in a very mild way, one guy did it almost in a lighthearted way. I'll tell you the two guys. I'll go ahead and mention their names. Um, one was, uh, some of you guys might be familiar with this, this guy. He's a, he was a, a former co-speaker of mine at the 21 convention. And most people consider him, a uh, the number one protege of Rolo Tomasi. And that's a guy who goes by the name Richard Cooper. He has a channel called Entrepreneurs in Cars. And he did like at least two interviews with me, maybe even three. Yeah, back in 2017, 2018, I did a minimum of two interviews with him. And I want to say I might have done as many as three. And um, during one of those interviews, he said, Alan, can I tell you something, man, without you getting offended? I said, go for it. He said, he said, man, I know you use the title dating coach, but he said, I don't think you're a dating coach. He said, I really don't. And I said, okay. He said, here's, here's my thing, man. He said, because you said on a number of your videos that if your objective is casual sex, you don't even go out on dates, <laughs> which is true. He said, when you, he said, when your objective is casual sex, you said a number of times that you don't even go out on dates. 
So he said, that's one reason why I would say, how can you call yourself a dating coach when you're not really advising guys what to do on a date? He said, when I hear the term dating coach, I tend to assume that that person is going to give me advice on what to do on a date. He said, you don't really give much advice on what to do on a date. He said, this is how I see you. He said, you're more of a verbal seduction and kinky, dirty talk coach. That's how I see you. I see you as a guy whose who's main specialty is verbal seduction and kinky, dirty talk. And he says, that's how I kind of refer to you as like, if I'm talking to people who follow me, I'll say Alan Roger Curry, the verbal seduction coach, the verbal seduction and kinky, dirty talk coach. He said, because that that's where I think you have the highest area of expertise and, and the best advice is when it comes to stuff related to verbal seduction and kinky, dirty talk. But he said dating in general, he said, again, you, you don't really give guys advice on what to do on like a dinner date or lunch date or movie date. So because of that, he said, I, I feel funny calling you a dating coach. And then again, I didn't, I didn't take offense to that assessment of his. And one other person said almost the same thing was uh, the, 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 the controversial black male YouTuber, Mumia Obsidian Ali. He said that back in, uh, I think it was 2018. I think it was the same year that Richard Cooper said it. He said that during one of his live streams. He said, I don't know why people call Alan Roger Curry a dating coach. He said, he's not a dating coach. He's not. He said, I don't care what anybody says. He said, Alan Roger Curry is not a dating coach. He said, among other reasons, he said, he doesn't really tell you like what clothes to put on if you're going out on a date with women, what type of restaurants to go to if you're going out on a date, what type of activities to do on the various dates. He said, Alan Roger Curry doesn't really give you any of that type of advice. He said, now here's where I compliment Alan Roger Curry. He said, when it comes to anything related to verbal communications, verbal communication, conversation skills, he said, Alan Roger Curry clearly knows what the fuck he's talking about. He said, Alan Roger Curry in that area clearly knows what he's talking about. He knows every aspect of verbal communications and conversations, to improving your conversation skills with women and, you know, stuff like verbal seduction and talking dirty to women. He says he knows his shit in that area. I never take nothing away from him in that area. But he said just overall dating, he said Alan Roger Curry is not really, he doesn't really give you a lot of advice compared to other people about just the overall nature of dating. So those are two guys who, uh, Ryan Harris said, by the way, you should write a whole book on Dirty Talk. What? Moderators, I'm almost tempted to have you ban Ryan Harris. Obviously, obviously. Ryan Harris, you must not be familiar with my book called Who Said Again? Because Who Said Again is all about verbal seduction and erotic dirty talk. So what are you talking about? I need to write a book about dirty talk when I already have a book about dirty talk. That's what Who Said Again is about. If I was to write another book about erotic dirty talk, it would be redundant considering that I already have a, a popular best-selling book called Who Said Again? So I don't know where that comment came from, Ryan Harris. Maybe you knew, like somebody said, maybe he's new. Yeah, Ryan, I, I already wrote a book on verbal seduction and kinky erotic dirty talk. Iceberg said, Alan... He might be new, so I'll let him slide. Yeah, Ryan got to be new, man, because everybody knows I already got a book out there about that. Um, now, off the subject, here's what I want to uh, I want to show real quick. You know, everybody knows I'm I'm a proud husband and a proud father of a son. I'm a proud husband which some people thought I would never have that title. <laughs> in my early years, I think a lot of my followers and supporters didn't think they would ever hear me uh, use the title of husband. A lot of guys thought I was going to be a womanizing bachelor for the rest of my life. 
See, even some of my own closest friends, fraternity brothers, and I would say there was a few years where even my own older brother, Stephen, thought I was going to be a womanizing bachelor for the rest of my life. But as most people know, I got engaged on Valentine's Day of 2020 and got married in mid-July of 2020 to this beautiful woman right here. That is my wife of over a year. That is my wife. And she and I produced this little fella. That's my son, Caden. C-A-Y-D-E-N. My wife took these pictures. That's my son, Caden, right there. I love this little fella to death. Man, I love this fella to death. He makes me smile and laugh every single day. That's my son, Caden. Yep, that is my son. I love that little fella. Yeah, there he is. There he is. That's my son, Caden, right there. That's my son. Love that little fella to death. He is, what is he now? He's just over 13 months old. Just over 13 months old. He was born on September 14th of 2020. Now, this is the picture. This picture right here of the four pictures I have right now that I'm going to show you. This is a picture where if I put, I should have found an older picture of me when I was a, a, a toddler and put it right next. He looks almost just like me when I was his age. Of all the pictures my wife recently took, this picture right here is a picture where I would say he looks the most like me when I was his same age. Yeah, we, 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 we almost look just alike in that picture right there. Yep, there he is. Little Caden. Caden Walker Curry, that's my son, the future of the Mo One Empire. That's right. Little handsome devil. I love that guy to death. I love that dude to death. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. I love me some, some Caden, man. That is my dude. I'll take 12 bullets in order to save his life. I, I love it. I love that little dude. And again, I love my wife too. I love her to death. I love it. I know some people say, oh, Alan, you sound all, you know, one of my haters right now, like, man, Alan, man, you sound all beta and shit. Tell my man, you love your wife and your family, man. That's like beta shit, man. They ain't really alpha and shit, man. That's like beta and shit. You all talking that lovey-dovey shit, you know, man. Told you, man. And Reggie Curry, he ain't really alpha and shit. Oh, when I, I mentioned on a previous live stream that one of the first times I talked about direct game on a national level was when Oprah Winfrey interviewed me. There's a, a low quality photo from that interview. Yeah, Oprah, the, the legendary Oprah Winfrey interviewed me in February of 1987. Yep, and for about not long, but at least for about 20 to 30 seconds, I actually dropped some direct verbal game advice during that interview. Because Oprah, when she interviewed me at that time, she was under the impression that all men lie to women to get them to have casual sex. She was under the impression that all men engage in dishonest, disingenuous, and misleading and manipulative behavior. I can't remember her exact question or comment, but she said something to the effect. She said, she asked me like, don't all men lie to women to get them to agree to casual sex, because women, we don't really love, we don't really like casual sex. And I said, no, Oprah, that ain't true. I said, I ain't never lied to a woman um, to get her to have casual sex. And she was like, really? I said, no. I, I said, I told her, I said, I tell women straight up that all I want is casual sex. I tell women straight up. And anybody in the audience was like, what? Are you, is he serious? And Oprah even looked at me for at least a couple of seconds, like, like, seriously? Yeah, I told I told Oprah essentially about my own one. I said, I said, no, I never lie to women or, you know, act like I want to be their boyfriend to get them to have casual sex with me. Um, because her main theme of questioning when she interviewed me, 
the whole segment of that show was about one night stands and weekend flings and why don't men call women back, call them again after they have a, you know, a one night stand or weekend fling. What I, my basic response was, I said, I tell women straight up that all I want to do is have a one night stand or a weekend fling with them. So I was like, why would they be expecting me to call them beyond that? Only a guy who's 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 giving a woman the misleading impression that he wants to have a relationship with a woman would have that woman expecting him to call back later. But I told Oprah, I said, I don't do that. So that was, you could say, taking my first time on a national level, dropping direct verbal game. I said, I let women know that my only interest is a few days or maybe a couple weeks of casual sex. I don't, I don't give women. And she was actually, she was genuinely surprised by that. And a lot of women who were in the audience was generally, they was, they, was, they, was, they basically had an attitude like, I've never heard of a man just straight up telling a woman that all he wants from her is casual sex. That's like foreign. That's how most of the women were reacting. They were basically like, I've never heard of that. So for all those guys who, who tend to be under this misguided belief that a lot of guys in the 80s who were in my age group were direct just like me, that's a lie. <laughs> I was a, I was always an exception to the rule. I was always an exception to the rule. Because most guys, man, have always been liars and emotional manipulators. Most guys have always been liars and emotional manipulators. Or, if they, or at minimum, if they weren't liars and emotional manipulators, at minimum, they were vague and ambiguous, which, of course, is what I call mode two. They were vague and vague and mode two again is when you don't flat out lie to a woman. You don't flat out go as far as to tell a woman you want to be a next long term boyfriend. But at the same time, you're not bold enough or courageous enough to let her know that all you want from her is casual sex either. So you're vague and ambiguous. But uh, yeah, when Oprah was talking to me, I let her know. I said I don't roll like that. I don't roll like that. I don't mislead women to get in bed. Because how old was I at that time? Because I didn't start being my one until I was like 21. I was like 21 and a half. That that interview, when Oprah interviewed, that was in February of 87. So that was right before my 24th birthday. Yeah, that was about a month. That interview happened about a month before my 24th birthday. But yeah, that was the first time you could say I technically was dropping some direct verbal game wisdom on a national level. It was when Oprah Winfrey interviewed me. Yeah, in February. Yeah, I had that, I had that audience cracking up, man. I had them cracking up, man. <laughs> They, they found a lot of stuff I said funny. I was mixing in humor with just bold truth. I mixed in humor with bold truth. And yeah, it, it had the audience cracking up. Um, so speaking of direct verbal game. Now, I know I always say this a lot of times in my pre-recorded videos. You know, some I'll say, this pre-recorded video is only going to be 30 minutes. It ends up being 45 minutes or longer. And I did that with at least one of my previous live streams. I said it was going to be no longer than 90 minutes and it ended up being about two hours and 10 minutes. This should be a 90-minute video or less because I don't have all that much to talk about. I just want to hit on a few things. And one main thing I'm going to be just reiterating again. Um, let me make sure I didn't miss any. Oh, I got to mention my obligatory mention. My Cash App, thank you for after my last live share, I received some Cash Apps and some PayPal donations. Oh, one guy wrote me, and I'm sorry if, if I confused you guys. One guy actually wrote me and said that I, I said something that, that left people confused in the chat room. He said, Alan, I was under the impression that you didn't want us super chatting anymore. Because he said, you may mention in the last live stream, you said, I don't really like super chats as much as I do PayPal donations or Cash App because YouTube takes 30% of the super chat. 
So I think a lot of us in the chat room were an impression you didn't want us to super chat you because YouTube takes almost a third of the money. No, I still am welcome to super chats. I still am welcome to super chats. Um, but yeah, the other way is to donate money during a live stream or right after last year. I, I have the cash up in my description section in my PayPal link in my in my moderators. They can even put it in the in the chat room. But uh, yeah, I wanted to clear that up. I'm not, I'm not I don't have an aversion to super chats, but what I said is the truth. Yeah, YouTube, I don't get a hundred percent of my super chat money. Yeah, YouTube takes. I think is if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think it's roughly thirty percent. Yeah, they take thirty percent of my YouTube money. So if I was to get a thousand dollars for one live stream in super chat earnings, YouTube would pocket three hundred dollars of that a thousand dollars, and I would pocket seven hundred. That's how it works. Um. Yeah, see, this is what I'm talking about. Loving your wife. Super alpha. Are you kidding? Yeah, some, I did a video on that, though. There's some guys who do, man. They think, I did a video called, Is Love and Marriage Representative of Being a Simp? Because there's some guys, I ain't going to say all guys, but there's a, a sizable percentage of guys associated with both the worldwide manosphere and the black manosphere that think, if you're pro marriage or pro romantic love, then that means you're a simp. Then that means you're a simp, which is goofy. Which is goofy. <laughs> That's just goofy, man. And see, what I don't want to go on a, on a digression or a tangent, but see, here's what's contradictory about that. You got some guys that say, for example, that the idea of romantic love or an emotional connection is represented being a simp. But then a lot of these same guys who say that, what do they do when they're trying to score casual sex? They say stuff like, you need to build rapport and you need to establish an emotional connection. Where's my dog face at when I need it? Where's my dog face at when I need it? That's goofy. That's goofy as fuck. That just shows you the stupidity among some men in this space, man. On one hand, they'll be they'll say they're anti-romantic love, anti-emotionally bonding with women, but then they'll say, hey, if you want to get a woman to have casual sex with you, you know, you gotta develop an emotional connection. For the main time, I don't try to develop an emotional connection with any woman that I just casually want to fuck, ever. Ever in my life. Ever. <laughs> ever. I ain't never attempted to build rapport or connect with a woman emotionally when I knew my objective was casual sex. I tell women straight up, I'm just trying to fuck you. So before I get started, let me look at my. Uh... I didn't know that Paul was in here. What's up, Paul? My man, Paul. Those guys who criticize you being a beta lack the knowledge to understand what is the true definition. Yeah, they. <sighs> oh, Deanna says she saw that Oprah Winfrey interview with me. <laughs> wow, that's my homegirl from Gary, Indiana. She said, I saw that show. That was classic. Oprah Allen, 80s. Yeah, that was in February of 1987. I had it on Facebook for a couple months, but then um, talking about stuff. You know, I talk about a lot about copyright infringement, intellectual property. Yeah, man. Harpo, which is Oprah's company, Harpo, they don't play. First, I had it on YouTube, and about two months after I uploaded YouTube, I got a note from YouTube saying Harpo Productions is demanding that you take it down. Otherwise, they're going to take you to court. I was like, dang, Oprah don't play. Same thing happened on Facebook. I had it on Facebook. And a few weeks later, I got a message 
saying that Harpo Productions has demanded that you take this video down or we will take you to court. See, what a lot of people don't realize when it comes to stuff like trademarks and copyrights and all that kind of stuff, when it comes to major companies and corporations, they have a they have a team of attorneys specifically dedicated to that. So they don't have to talk about it the way I do. I'm an individual entrepreneur. But companies like a Harpo or any major corporation like Coca-Cola Company or Pepsi or McDonald's, all of those companies, man, they literally have a team of at least 10 or more attorneys that that's their job on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis is to look for infringements on their copyrighted stuff, their trademark stuff, their patents, and all that. And they 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 take people to court regularly. They take people to court regularly. Y'all remember um, if there was two tech giants that went at it in court. Uh, if you, I mentioned this on at least one video before. I remember when. Uh, Apple sued Samsung for billions of dollars because they were basically like, Samsung, you're still in our patented technology. You're still in our shit, man. And they took them to court and they won. They did. They won. They got a judgment. I don't remember the exact amount of the judgment, but they got a judgment. Apple took Samsung to court because they was like, dude, y'all are stealing a lot of our original patented technology and just duplicating it under your brand name of Samsung. Basically, y'all taking Apple technology, copying it, and then marketing it as Samsung technology when it's not. It's Apple technology. Y'all using Apple technology. That's technically, if you know the story, I'm not going to, here I go with these digressions. That's what Bill Gates did with Steve Jobs. Windows was basically Steve Jobs' technology. And he just essentially stole it and applied it to PCs instead of Apple computers. Anyway. Steven, 499, thank you. The gift that keeps on giving. I don't to create live stream. Mo one. Okay, get this clown out of here. Who is this dude? Okay, I just... Uh, I think somebody already handled it. Some guy named Crypto, man. See? <laughs> but I can't be too mad because I did say that uh, haters is half the reason, over half the reason I do YouTube videos. Haters is over half the reason I do YouTube videos. Okay, I'm going to get into my topic. And like I said, um, I should be done in like 30 or 40 minutes. I'm not going to talk too long. Um, As you see by the title, and for a lot of y'all, this is going to be, I'm going to just forewarn you, it's going to be ultra competitive. I mean, competitive, repetitive. It's going to be ultra repetitive. The last time I talked about this this year, was when I did the video, pre-recorded video, where I talked about uh, Myron Gaines of Fresh and Fit fame. You know, and he had that controversy involving a woman named Anna Quinn Fitness. And now, actually, I I am disappointed some of y'all. That's not a free video anymore. That's a members-only video now. You can watch it if you're a Patreon subscriber. But if you're not a Patreon subscriber, you got to become a YouTube member of my channel. In order to watch that video now. But I'm going to be actually repeating some of the stuff. But what happened in that situation, he was direct with Anna Quinn for the most part. He wasn't 100% direct. But I would say for the most part, he was direct in letting her know he wanted to sleep with her. First, he invited her to do a business collaboration. Then right after that, he told her he wanted to sleep with her and that he only does business collaborations with women that he plans on sleeping with. And when that all happened, there were quite a few guys in the ministry that would say, oh, Myron Gaines was mole one. Myron Gaines was mole one. It looks like mole one didn't work. 
Myron Gaines was small one. Myron Gaines was small one. No. No. Here's what I'm sick of, and this happened as recently as either last night or early this morning. Somebody was talking about something to do with tax game. Remember I was talking about how some dating coaches have areas of expertise that I don't when I was talking about collaborations? Well, I'll tell you one area I don't really hardly talk about at all is what's commonly known as tax game. See, there's different forms of game. In different forms of game. I usually highlight five, but text game, you could say is a legitimate, given in this modern technology society, you could say that's a legitimate form for some guys of game. Here would be the three forms of nonverbal game I've emphasized. The three main forms of nonverbal game would be looks game, Looks game, when you use the, the aesthetic appeal of either your face, your physique, or both, or even the way you dress as a tool to help you connect with women romantically and sexually. Looks game. I know my fellow... Dating coach uh, Ron Wills, he emphasizes what's known as body game a lot, which is a subcategory of looks game. Yeah, he emphasizes body game, which is the emphasis more on the physique, the appeal of your physique than the appeal of your face, would be called body game. And a lot of, a lot of other dating coach PUAs who have a background usually in like health and fitness, personal training, usually emphasize body game. And I was mentioned on previous live stream, I rarely, I only touch on stuff related to looks game like occasionally. That is not a major area of my expertise, is looks game. I touch on that occasionally, but I don't really touch on looks game. Another form of nonverbal game is money and status game. Money and status game. Now, technically, I'm going to be honest with you. This is just my own personal opinion. My own personal opinion. I don't really look at tricking as being representative of having game. I don't really look at being a sugar daddy as being representative of having game. So for Alan Roger Curry individually, I don't really believe in the idea of money game. Or even, for that matter, fame and status game. Fame and status game. But among a lot of people in general, a lot of people in the ministry in general do acknowledge uh, wealth as being a form of game and fame and status as being a form of game. Uh, now, this is a form of game I do emphasizing my one-on-one face-to-face coaching sessions was commonly called sub-communication. Sub-communications. Some people, a lot of black men, they don't use that term. They use a uh, masculine energy game. That's what most black men call sub-communication is masculine energy game or um, vibe Sexual vibe game is another term I've heard for subcommunication. Yeah, among black guys, I've heard both masculine energy game, or some black guys call that um, sexual vibe. Sexual vibe game. But yeah, I, I, the number one time I emphasize like nonverbal, um, you're not you're like your demeanor, your disposition, and just your nonverbal energy in the company of a woman is primarily in my one-on-one face-to-face coaching sessions. 
Then, so, now there's uh, at least two, three, maybe even four additional forms of nonverbal game, and I mentioned one already. Text game. Text game would fall under the category of nonverbal because it's not spoken. Text game would technically fall in the category, it would be a subcategory of nonverbal game. Um, using drugs and alcohol, which I don't approve of because in today's society, that's, that's a form of date rape. But if you were to use drugs or alcohol to get a woman in bed, that would be a form of nonverbal game. And what else? Oh, just overpowering a woman physically, which is also illegal. That's essentially rape or date rape. Groping a woman and physically overpowering her, that would be a form of nonverbal game. But I don't mention it because it's unethical and basically illegal. So those are the various forms of nonverbal game. And then there's two forms a verbal game, of course, which is direct verbal game and indirect verbal game. Direct verbal game and indirect verbal game. Now, if everybody is familiar, of course, with my four modes of verbal, emphasis on the word verbal, if everybody's familiar with my four modes of verbal communication, they know I have two modes under each category. The two modes that are representative of indirect verbal game would be mode two and mode three. Mode two and mode three. Anytime you're exhibiting some variation of mode two behavior or some variation of mode three behavior, that means you're employing indirect verbal game. That means you're employing indirect verbal game with a woman. And on the flip side, anytime you're exhibiting some variation of mode one behavior or mode four behavior, Mode one behavior or mode four behavior, that's representative of direct verbal game. That's representative of direct verbal game. Now, let me bring up my registered trademarks where I have that trademark, the four modes of verbal. Hey, now I lost it. Oh, here it is. Okay, you see it on there. These are my registered trademarks. One of them is the four modes. Now, does that say the four modes, simply the four modes of communication? No. Does that say the four modes of uh, written communication? No. Does that say the four modes of sexual communication? No. The four modes of subcommunication? <laughs> Nope. Says the four modes of verbal communication. Four modes of verbal communication. Get it, got it good. Here's the problem, man, with a lot of people. This has been going on literally. Some stuff is just almost a YouTube thing. Some stuff that, that people say that irritates me didn't happen before I got on YouTube. It's almost exclusively a YouTube thing. This is something that's even been happening even before I got on YouTube. So this is not just exclusively a YouTube thing. It really kind of relates to a criticism I received on one of my live streams from a guy speaking of my registered trademarks. It's what caused me two live streams ago to bring up those registered trademarks. Because I had a guy write me after not my last live stream, the live stream before that. I had a guy write me, and he said, Alan, he said, you act like you personally invented or created the concept of direct verbal game. He said, there were other guys before you who were using direct verbal game. I'm sure guys were using direct verbal game for centuries. And I don't argue with that. And I may mention that in my last live stream or two live streams ago. But here's where he fucked up. On that point, that's actually valid. I was inspired by a guy, a fictional character in a, in a porn movie that was using direct verbal game. So I know direct verbal game 
existed before me. So when you say direct verbal game in general existed before me, I can't argue with that. That's valid. But here's when you're invalid is when you go and take a step further and say, he said, there were guys using, oh, I didn't see this. Thank you for that super chat. Tricking his life, Jack. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Why are people concerned about why I'm monetized? Somebody wrote me yesterday talking about, Alan, you don't have ads. No, I turn, I turn uh, for my live streams, I turn monetization off. I monetize in the sense that I can receive super chats. But if you're talking about monetization in form of ads, most of the time I turn monetization off because when I turned it on, I always end up getting a, um, a note from YouTube saying, your videos had too much profanity and sexually explicit language in it. So they'll say either we can't put any ads on there or we can only put adult-oriented ads. So but a lot of people are concerned with me being monetized. I had a guy just yesterday write me asking me, um, Black Wolf. <laughs> First time I see them in my, thank you, Black Wolf. Ain't seen you in a while, man. You've been AWOL. Good to see you in, in my chat room, man. I appreciate it. Oh, this old brother. Uh, here you go. Even though he ain't that much older than me because I'm 58 myself. Look at him. He's a character. This guy's a character. Watch out for him. He's a character. Um, okay. Back to my topic. People say I get distracted with the chat room, so I can't get too distracted with the chat room because people see it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. If I if I totally ignore the chat room, people say, well, man, what's the point of having live streams, man? You ain't interacting with people in real time. What's the point of having a live stream, man? You might as well have a pre-recorded video if you ain't gonna be interacting with us in real time, man. Then when I interact with the chat room, people say, hey, man, I didn't come here to see you, you know, giving shout outs and talking to people in the chat room, man. You know, I want I want to hear the content. Damn if you do, damn if you don't. Casual Black with $4.99. ARC, you may not have started direct approach, but you certainly started and added the flair to direct propaganda. Okay, that's what I'm getting into. It shouldn't be, like I said, too lengthy. But, and, and again, I, I've covered this before. Number one. I'll start here. There's a lot of guys that think Mo One is synonymous with any form of direct communication. There's some guys both in the worldwide manosphere and in the black manosphere that think Mo One is synonymous with any form of direct communication. Not true. Not true. And I've said this only probably like 579 times since I've been on YouTube. <laughs> and I, ain't, I don't even have that many videos. <laughs> okay, I might be exaggerating. I didn't say it 579 times. But it feels like it. Mo one is not, my Mo1 approach is not synonymous with all forms of direct communication. Here's an analogy I always like to say. Can you say that every double cheeseburger that's sold at a fast food joint is representative of a Big Mac? No, you can't. All Big Macs are representative of a double cheeseburger. All Big Macs are representative of a double cheeseburger. But not all double cheeseburgers a representative of a Big Mac, if you follow in that analogy. Every Big Mac prepared is representative of a double cheeseburger, but not all double cheeseburgers are representative of a Big Mac. Another super chat from Black Wolf. So I've been able OG just got a new job and working nonstop for the last two months. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the update, man. Hope everything's well with you. Yeah, man. Black Wolf is a super cool young brother. Um, in 
And if you were to use that analogy with Mo One, it's the same with Mo One. Every form of my Mo One approach is representative of using direct verbal game, but not every form of direct verbal game is representative of the Mo One approach. I'll start here. First, I'm going to start since I mentioned text game because that's, that's kind of what provoked this. Somebody was talking about texting a woman on a, on a live stream or a podcast or something, and somebody in the chat room I saw said, yeah, be Mo One. Mo, uh, being direct with a woman in written form is not representative of being Mo One. And again, the last time I said this was when I was talking about the whole Myron Gaines situation. And I've said it a number of times before. Written game, if you're talking to a woman through email, text message, social media messages, all that type of stuff, is that representative of upfront, straightforwardly honest communication, period? Yes. Is it representative of more one? No. Matter of fact, speaking of upfront, straightforward. That's probably my, one of my more overlooked books. I published that in March, no, April of 2009. April 2009. See, here's the deal. This book you see on the screen, up front and straightforward, that book is just solely and specifically about being verbally direct, which is the major component of Mall One but it's not the only component of Mo One. And I, I pointed this out a number of times. Being verbally direct is the number one component and main component of Mo One, but it's not the only component of Mo One. First, I want to switch on verbal versus nonverbal. Yeah, if you text it, like, let's say you had a guy who texted a woman and said, I want to fuck you. Some people say, oh, that man, that dude was more one. No, he wasn't. He was verbally direct. I mean, he was direct. He was upfront and straightforward, which is, again, the title of that book. He was upfront and straightforward, but he went more one. More one centers on being verbally direct, meaning you talking to a woman either face to face, over the phone, through Skype, or some other type of video app, something like that. That's verbal. When you're speaking your words with your mouth, verbal. That's more one. Anything in written form is not more one. Again, you can categorize that as being direct and upfront and straightforward, but you couldn't categorize it as being more one. Mo one is verbal, verbal, verbal. And that's the biggest reason why I said when Myron Gaines sent that, that message to that woman, Anna Quinn, I said he was not Mo one because it wasn't verbal, man. It wasn't verbal. That's the whole reason I do one-on-one face-to-face coaching with clients is they help them with their verbal communication. I don't do one-on-one face-to-face coaching sessions with clients to help them with their written communication. Shit, I could do that through an email consultation. I could do that through an email consultation. Why would I ever need to do either a Skype, Zoom, or telephone consultation, or a or even more so a one-on-one face-to-face coaching session to help someone with their written game? I could do that. I could accomplish that through an email consultation, which is my most inexpensive form of coaching. I can help them do that. And, and I don't I don't concentrate on what's known nowadays as text game. Now, there are some PUAs and dating coaches that do concentrate on text game and more power to them. That's not an area of expertise of mine. That is, I, I only you when I deal with women in my life before I got married, the only time I used text messages was to either set up a face-to-face interaction or to set up a future, a, a phone call for the near future. One of those two. The only time I use text message or written communication was to set up either a face-to-face meeting with that woman 
Or if the woman lived out of town and I wasn't able to see her in the near future face to face to set up a phone conversation. That's the only time I use written game, man. When I was single, before I got married. That was the only time I used like stuff like text messages and shit. I never had lengthy conversations with women through like text messages and shit. You know who wanted to do that? And I kind of participate a little bit. If you got my book, who said it again? You know, I got the six verbal seduction stories. If there was one verbal seduction story on top of that, that involves some degree of written communication was verbal seduction story number five with the woman named Danielle, the real uppity, pretentious chick I messed around with. She was a graduate of University of Chicago, which is a very prestigious university. And she let me know that. <laughs> she was so pretentious, man. If you're familiar with Northwestern University, you'll know Northwestern University is considered one of the top universities in the country, definitely in the, in the Big Ten Conference. This woman, I, I inadvertently said, oh, so you graduated from Northwestern. She was like, Northwestern? Like, ugh. <laughs> she was talking about, she treated Northwestern like it was a community college. And again, Northwestern is, is a top-notch academic school. She was like, Northwestern? No. She said, I graduated from the University of Chicago. University of Chicago is like a Midwestern equivalent to an Ivy League school. That's what University of Chicago is. University of Chicago is a Midwestern equivalent to an Ivy League school. Anyway, so that's number one clarification. I don't consider any form of written game to be more one. Again, I consider that to be direct in general and upfront and straightforward. Matter of fact, on, on, on the light I know, I had a guy a few months ago. I had a guy write me, and he mentioned this book. He mentioned all of my books, actually. He said, Alan, <laughs> he said, I... I he said, I know all your books are already published, so obviously you can't change the order in which they were released. But he said, in retrospect, man, I don't think Mo One should have been your first book. He said, I don't think Mo One should have been your first book. And it kind of relates to my topic for the day. He said, he basically, his, his biggest point was, uh-oh, uh-oh, I can't miss Super Chats. Mo one till the death of me. Uh, thank you for that, Mangani. Thank you for that. He said, uh, just like I was a few minutes ago, I was saying, Mo one involves more than just being verbally direct. That's the main component of Mo one, but that's not the only component of Mo one. And this guy wrote me, it was a few months ago. He said, Alan, Here's the order which guys should read your books. And I know it's probably not going to be the same order that you promote, which is probably in line with how, when you released each of your books. But he said, this is how I see it being most effective. He said, Mo One shouldn't be the first book guys read. He said, I really believe that. Mo One should not be, believe it or not, the first book that guys read. He said, the first book that guys should read is your book, Upfront and Straightforward. And not too many guys even mention that book. Because see, in audiobook form, if you have if you own my Mo One audiobook, wait, hold on a second. If you own my Mo One audiobook, you'll know that it's actually a combination of my Mo One book and this book. So really, my Mo One audiobook is kind of like two books in one. It's a, it's a blend of both my Mo One book and my Upfront and Straightforward book. But going back to this guy, he said, this is how I see it, Alan, how you should promote your books to guys. He said, the first book they should read is Upfront and Straightforward, in my opinion. He said, that's the first book they should read. 
He said the second book they should read is No Free Attention. He said they should read No Free Attention. He said, I think that should be the second book they read. And then follow that up by listening to the Possibility of Sex audiobook. So he, he, to give a recap, he said, guys should start here. He said, that's the first book I think all guys should read. Then he said, the second book they should read is No Free Attention and immediately follow that up with the audiobook version of The Possibility of Sex. He said, and then they should listen to the Ooh Say It Again audiobook. Then he said they should listen to the Beta Male Revolution. And then the, the, he said the last audiobook they should listen to is Mo One. Now, he actually said that's the last audiobook they should listen to. He said, because it makes more sense. And, you know, in his defense, in his defense, I've had at least a half a dozen guys that in the last few months have said something similar, not totally what he said, but I had a few, about a half a dozen guys that said, Alan, they, they, they would give me feedback on my book, uh, No Free Attention, which is technically a rewrite of The Possibility of Sex. I had about five or six guys that read No Free Attention. They said, Alan, I'm going to tell you honestly, man. That book made me appreciate your Mo One book even better. I always thought your Mo One book was good. But these guys said, in one way or another, they said, to me, you're not going to really truly appreciate the knowledge, wisdom, insight, and advice in your Mo One book until you first read no free attention. They was, they was basically implying that they said no free attention should be like a prerequisite before reading Mo One. Yeah, I had at least minimum about five, six guys that told me that. They, they were like, man, yeah, they was like, no free attention, man, made me love Mo One even more. And the guy I was originally talking about, he pretty much said that. Again, his order. Uh, reading, he said, he said, I think the first book man should read is Upfront and Straightforward. He said that book emphasized just the general concept of being verbally direct, period. Verbally direct. He said, then the second book I think guys should read is No Free Attention. He said, the reason for that, I think that should be the second book, because that's the book that mainly helps guys get over their fear of rejection, which is very important with Mo One, and I'm going to get to that in a second. He said that's the book that helps guys get over their fear of rejection. He said because there ain't no point in you trying to be verbally direct with women if you're still profoundly afraid of rejection. He said it ain't no point. It defeats the purpose. He said So he said no for attention should be the second book guys should read. He said, third, they should listen to the audiobook version of The Possibility of Sex. Then they'll understand how a combination of how manipulative and materialistic women are. They'll understand basically, he said, the combination of no free attention and possibly of sex helps men understand your concept of the manipulative time waster, which is an important part of BMO 1. He said, then after that, they should listen to Ooh Say It Again, which is about being verbally smooth, verbally seductive, and improving your verbal seduction skills and your kinky, erotic, dirty talk skills, which is highly important for seducing wholesome pretenders and erotic hypocrites. Then he said, you should, after that, you should listen to the Beta Male Revolution. Because he said that helps you understand why women tend to choose alpha males over beta males for casual sex. And on the opposite end, why they tend to choose beta males over alpha males a lot of times for long-term relationships and to take advantage of them financially. And then he said the last audio book a guy should read 
in this guy's opinion, he said, was Mo One. Because Mo One kind of puts all those other books kind of together. It's kind of like the summation of all the knowledge you gain from the other books. He says, so instead of that book being the first book guys read if they got the ebook or paperback or listen to if they got the audiobook, he said that should be the last book that guys pick up. Is is he prefers the audiobook more than the ebook or paperback? He said the last audiobook that guys should listen to is Mo One. Because he, he basically said, and he argued that if you listen to the Mo One audiobook first, and you haven't listened to Beta Male Revolution, you haven't listened to Who Say It Again, you haven't listened to Possibly Sex, you haven't read No Free Attention, you haven't read uh, Up Front and Straightforward, he said, you're going to be kind of lost in Mo One. You're going you're gonna to kind of find yourself feeling like, okay, why would I want to do this? <laughs> That's what he said. He said, you're going to kind of find yourself feeling like, okay, why would I want to be Mo One? What's wrong with being Mo Two? What's wrong with being Mo Two? And again, in his defense, I've heard that from a few guys. Similar comments. He said, you're going to feel like, what's wrong with being Mo Two? If you just start off reading Mo One, you're going to feel like, okay, what's. Yeah, I kind of understand where Alan's coming from with this Mo One stuff, but what's so wrong with Mo Two? But he said, if you do all them other books first, he said, you're going to be like, oh, I see why Alan is all about Mo One now. I, I understand why Alan is all about Mo One now after I've taken in the information from the other books. I totally understand why Alan is only about being Mo One. Totally understand it. Naima. Naima, one of the best YouTube moderators on YouTube. She's been a moderator for a lot of people, particularly people on the what they call the black side of YouTube. Yeah, Naima is super cool. Super cool. Uh, now, since Naima's in here, that means I got to show. I got to show. And I love how she calls me King Allen. You know, I used to get that a lot in my comment section. I haven't seen it in recent. I think since I got married, a lot of my former BDSM subs. But a lot of women who either were former BDSM subs of mine or just general casual lovers, uh, BDSM clients of mine, and women who listen to my adults only podcast, the Erotic Conversationalists. Almost all women in those four categories refer to me as King Allen. Like, remember in the last live stream, I was talking about I used to have a female supporters group? Nobody called me Allen in that female supporters group. Nobody. And that's the honest truth. Nobody called me Allen, just simply Allen. They would either call me Sir. Daddy, Mr. Curry, or King Allen. Those are my four names in my female supporters groups. Nobody just ever called me just Allen or ARC the way guys do. All the women either called me Sir, Daddy. The most formal and tame was Mr. Curry or King Allen. Yeah, man, I don't. I don't love women that I'm intimate with to call me Alan. I really don't. That, that might sound extreme, but I don't. I really don't. For years now, I never call. I never allow a woman that I've been romantically or sexually intimate with to simply call me Alan. They got to call me Sir, Daddy, King Alan, or at bare minimum, Mister Curry. Um. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the brother here got strong BDSM Dom game, man. I'm strong with my BDSM Dom game. That's the next book that a lot of guys want me to write. A lot of guys want me to write another book. They want me to write a book about being a BDSM Dom, man. But yeah, that's one of my forms of, of, of domination. It's real. That's a minor form of domination, just, you know, having a woman call you sir or daddy. But yeah, I don't... I. I can't remember the last time I, I had sex with a woman that just called me Alan. <laughs> yeah, I would almost literally, and I'm not even joking here, I would almost have to go back to like high school to think of the last woman I was intimate with that just regularly called me like Alan. Starting with my college days, man, that 
I, I, I mentioned this in a previous live stream. When I watched Talk Dirty to Me Part 2, not the original Talk Dirty, Talk Dirty, the original, but the sequel, starting with when I saw Talk Dirty to Me Part 2, from literally from, almost from that day forward, I made every woman I fuck call me sir. <laughs> every woman I fuck. Either, in some cases, not even fuck. Women who I've had phone sex with. Next, I would say next to physical sex, phone sex. Pretty much every woman I've had phone sex with has never called me just Alan. Again, they either call me Sir, Daddy, Mr. Curry, or King Alan. One of those four. Um, going back to my direct talk. See, y'all distracted me in the chat room. No, I, I, I'm not trying to make sure I don't miss any super chats. Um, well, I lied. I said this one going to be no more than 90 minutes. I, I, now, I made a lie on myself. Because in about five minutes, it's going to be the 90-minute mark. In about five minutes, it's going to be the 90-minute mark. Going back to my main point. Again, to reemphasize it. Not all forms of direct verbal game are representative of Mo 1. Because Mo 1 is not simply about being direct, or it's not even simply about being verbally direct. And I'm going to give you at least two or three examples, and then I'm going to wrap up and, and close shop. Here's the most obvious example. <laughs> Here's probably the most glaring and obvious example within the context of just my own books. Here's the most glaring example. Read what this says. Okay. Direct verbal game represents any time you approach a woman, initiate a conversation with her, and you verbally communicate to that woman exactly why you decided to approach her and initiate a conversation with her, and you proceed to verbally communicate to the woman specifically why you're interested in sharing her company in the near and or distant future. Dating coach Alan Roger Curry's Mall One approach is a specific brand, emphasis on that, is a specific brand and form, a specific brand and form of direct verbal game. Mall Four behavior, which is also included in Curry's books, is another form of verbally direct behavior but it has connotations of underlying anger, antagonism, bitterness, resentment, and misogyny. Drops mic. I'll give you a couple examples. Let's say you went up to a woman and you said, damn, you gotta be the ugliest bitch I've ever seen in my life. Is that, is that, or is that not being represented, being verbally bold and verbally direct with a woman? If you went up to a woman and said, damn, you got to be the ugliest woman I've ever seen in my life. That's very verbally bold to say that to a woman. That's very verbally direct to say that to a woman. But is that Mo one? Fuck no. Fuck no. Nobody can ever call that Mo one. That's an insult. That's a verbally bold, verbally direct insult. Anytime you're insulting a woman, it's not, it automatically is not Mo one. That's number one. Anytime you're issuing any type of insult or harsh opinionated criticism towards a woman, like let's say you went up to a woman, you said, damn, you got the flattest butt I've ever seen in my life. Or damn, you got the, the smallest titties of any woman I've seen in my life. Is that verbally bold? Yeah, that's verbally bold. Is that verbally direct? Yeah, that's verbally direct. Is that more one? No. No, that's not more one. Because you're insulting the woman. You're criticizing a woman. Mo one ain't got nothing to do with harshly criticizing a woman or insulting a woman. That's not Mo one. That would be Mo four. See the similarity between Mo four and Mo one. The, if there's at least one similarity, is is the verbally bold, verbally direct component. The verbally bold, verbally direct component. That's shared by both Mo one and Mo four. Anytime you exhibit either Mo 1 or Mo 4, you're being verbally bold and verbally direct. But beyond that, in terms of what's actually coming out your mouth, is what separates them. Again, Mo 4 centers around things like harsh, negative opinions of someone, insults of someone, you being very verbally aggressive, combination of verbally aggressive and verbally antagonistic. See, that's, 
That's mode four. Like a good example in my one of my seduction stories, verbal seduction story number number one, which is my most prominent of the six, is remember the point where the woman was taunting me, and I looked at dead in the eyes and I said, "Bitch, shut the fuck up." I just simply said, "Bitch, shut the fuck up." Was that mode one? No. No, that's mode four, and I say that in the book. That's mode four. Telling a woman, bitch, shut the fuck up is not more one. That's more four. I was angry. Anytime, like I said, you have connotations of anger in your voice and in what you're saying. That's not more one, man. That's not more one. That's more four. I like I like Harley call Mo four the evil twin to Mo one. That's what I like to call Mo four. I like Harley call it the evil twin to Mo one. So that's one example of that where you could be being verbally bold and verbally direct, but you're not more one. Let's say you're a married man, like I am. See my ring on my finger? Let's say you're a married man and you go up to a woman and let's say I'm a married man, but I take off my ring. I see I'm in a nightclub and I see an attractive woman. And I take off my ring so that none of the women in the nightclub will know I'm married. And I go up to a woman and I say, you are very attractive and you are very sexy and I want to fuck the shit out of you. And she says, really now? Hmm, That's pretty bold. That's pretty direct. And then she says, I bet you're married. Or I bet you got a girlfriend. And I say, without flinching, I look at dinner and I say, nope, no wife, no fiance, no girlfriend. And she says, really? And I say, yep. Okay, was I just verbally bold and verbally direct with that woman? Yes. In that example, yes, I was. Yes, I was. But what would disqualify from being more one? What would disqualify from being more one? I was a blatant liar. In that example, I was a married guy, but when the woman asked me, I bet you said to me, I bet you're married, or at least I bet you got a girlfriend, and I said no, I just blatantly lied, even though my lie was expressed in a very direct manner. It wasn't like a beat about around the bush lie. It was a very direct lie. See, that would fall into mode three. That wouldn't be mode one or mode four. That would be actually mode three. Now, anything that falls in the category of a blatant lie is mode three. Even if it's direct. Even though I've always said indirect, uh, mode three is usually about indirect game. But if you're blatantly lying, you that is a form of indirect verbal game. Even if it sounds direct. If you're blatantly lying to a woman, you're being indirect. Even though it sounds like you're being direct. Mo one does not include blatant lying, man. If you're telling any sort of lie, you're not being Mo one. Another thing is confidence. Your level of confidence and self assurance, and this relates to the sub communication part your demeanor and disposition. This is one of the reasons why I get paid, and if I say so myself, I get paid a lot of money for my one-on-one face-to-face coaching. Because realistically, if my one was just solely and specifically about being verbally direct, I wouldn't make much money off of one-on-one face-to-face coaching. I could accomplish that either through an email consultation or at minimum through a Skype, Zoom, or telephone consultation just a component of being verbally direct. This relates to a story I've mentioned on a couple of videos around, I think it was, I don't know, I think 2013, there was this, this video here, right here on YouTube that went viral called something to the effect of asking 100 women for sex at the beach. Put a number four in the, in the chat room if you know what video I'm talking about. 
It is, it's, it's about at least eight years old. It was called Asking 100 Women for Sex at the Beach. Oh, I see a super chat. Oh, here's my man with, he, man, you know this guy got high self-esteem. This brother right here got high self-esteem right here. Because his username is Handsome the Guy. Hey, welcome to our country club. I want to introduce you. I've, I'm sorry, sir. I forgot your name. Can you introduce yourself to all the country club members? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, I'm Handsome the Guy, man. Handsome the Guy. Pleasure to meet y'all. Pleasure to meet all of y'all. I'm Handsome the Guy. <laughs> ah, that needs a name, man. That's too much. He says, Mo one is about being verbally direct in a purely seductive way. Bingo. Yeah. But yeah, there was a video that came out. It was this Caucasian guy. He was mainly a prankster. He wasn't any type of like PUA or dating coach. He was more of a prankster. Hey, that was his category. He was a, he was, there's a lot of guys that have had videos, even a few women that they basically categorize themselves as street pranksters. Street pranksters. They say, go up to people and say outrageous stuff. Like, you know, like I saw a video where a woman was going up to me and saying, can I take a shit on you or something like that? Just anything outrageous. And um, so I remember at that time, again, this was roughly 2013, when that video went viral, because a lot of people were sharing it on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. A lot of people were sharing it. And a lot of my followers wrote me. They said, hey, Ella, man, what do you think about this guy being my one? It didn't seem like he had any success with being my one. He was getting rejected by almost every woman he approached. And the first thing I told everybody who wrote me at that time, I said, what makes you think he was my one? And they said, well, he was straightforwardly asking women if they wanted to have sex with him. I said, so? They were like, I thought that was my one. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I quickly told guys, I said, no, that's not my one. I said, is that him being verbally direct? Yes. Yeah, that would be, I would put that in a category of verbally bold and verbally direct. Yeah. So there, no problem. If you're evaluating strictly from the perspective of was he verbally bold and verbally direct, the answer would be yes. If the question is, was he more one? The answer would be no. Why not? Because, number one, there was nothing confident about his fucking demeanor. Nothing. At least in my opinion. It was corny, man. The dude was corny in his delivery. He didn't have no boatload of self-assurance. I Another thing, I never ask women if they would like to have sex with me. Never, ever do I ask women would they like to have sex with me. I never, ever do this. Starting with my early 20s up until my 50s. I've never asked a woman, hey, would you like to have sex with me? Would you like to join me later today for an episode of sex? I ain't never said no goofy, corny shit like that. I tell women that I want to fuck them. I express it as a statement, not a question, a statement. I'll let a woman know, like, I'll say something to the fact that, Damn, you're very attractive, very sexy. I want to fuck the shit out of you. Well, sometimes I'm even cocky and I'll say I'm going to. I've talked about that on a few videos. Some of y'all remember that. Yeah, sometimes I'm, I don't even say I want to. I say I'm going to. Like one of my most infamous stories that I've told a few times before was when I was on a train. This was like around 1990. I was on a commuter train that goes from Northwest Indiana to Chicago. I was working in downtown Chicago. And there was this black woman had this really nice, voluptuous shape. She was thick. She wasn't, you know how some women, they, they heavy, they got a lot of meat on their body, but it's proportional, like it's a, they got a small waist. That's how she was. She had like big tits, big round shoes. She had, she had this real small waist. And you could see the outline of her body in this leather coat. I remember she was wearing this form-fitting leather coat. And I went up to her and I said, I said, so, how soon you want to get together with me? And she said, excuse me? I said, you're excused. I said, how soon you want to get together with me? She said, I don't even know your name. I said, my name's Alan. 
She said, well, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm so-and-so. I said, pleasure to meet you, so-and-so. I said, yeah, we definitely need to hook up in the near future. And she said, and just why do we need to do that? I said, because I'm going to fuck the shit out of you. I didn't say, would you like for me to fuck you? I said, I'm going to fuck. I looked at Den I said, I'm going to fuck the shit out of you. And she was, she looked like, whoa. She said, did you really just say that? I said, I sure did. She said, do you always approach women this way? I said, why are you worried about other women? Why are you worried about other women? Just concentrate on you and I. I said, I don't know the exact date I'm going to fuck you. It might be within the week, within the next two weeks, might be within the next six to nine months. I said, so I can't put an exact date on it. But I said, I guarantee you. I told her, I gave a guarantee. I said, I guarantee you. I'm going to fuck you. And here was the kicker. Here was the kicker. This is the significance of this story. I said, not only am I going to fuck you, but I'm going to fuck you in that leather coat. She said, oh, really now? I said, yep. I said, I like the way you wear that leather coat. It's very form-fitting. I said, when I fuck you doggy style, you're going to have on that leather coat. And she just went, hmm. She said, you, you got a lot of confidence. She said, you're a very ass assured man. What was I talking about just a few minutes ago? Part of uh, being my one. Really? I would say you got to be confident bordering on cocky. Confident bordering on cocky. That's how I am with just about every woman I've approached in my life. I was confident bordering on cocky. And in some cases, I was full-blown cocky. Like, y'all know about the infamous Sharon? The woman, that's not her real name. The woman I call Sharon. The one that looks like, uh, the one that looks like the actress Sally, uh, uh, damn, I'm forgetting the real woman's name. What's this woman's name? <laughs> Sally J Richardson Whitfield. Her real name, Sally Richardson. Her married name is Sally Richardson Whitfield. The woman I always called Sharon, she looked like she could be Sally Richardson Whitfield's either sister or first cousin. But she's another woman I approached. I was very cocky with Sharon. I, the most cocky thing I said to Sharon, I said, I know you want to share my company. I told her that. I looked at dinner. I said, I know you want to share my company. I said, I have no doubt you want to share my company in the near future. I have no doubt. That's a component of my one, man. You're going to be a confident man. So again, going back to the guy on the beach, well, I don't, didn't consider his, for at least two reasons, I didn't consider his behavior my one. He was asking women, would you like to have sex with me? I don't ever teach a client to ask a woman, would you like to have sex with me? I don't ever tell you, I've never, since I've been a dating coach, instructed a man to say to a woman, would you like to have sex with me? That, that, that reeks of a lack of confidence. That reeks of a lack of confidence. I'm a bold, cocky motherfucker. Period. Drops mic. I'm a bold, cocky motherfucker, man. And that's why it doesn't bother me when I get rejected. A lot of guys have asked me, they say, Ellen, you seem so unfazed about being rejected. That's one of the reasons why. Because I'm both. See, you will find you got to do something. It's not going to ring true to you until you experience it yourself. When you're real bold, straightforwardly honest, and cocky with a woman, and it just so happens you get rejected, I guarantee you, you'll walk away from that rejection with a smile on your face. I guarantee you will. You'll walk away from that, that interaction with a smile on your face. See, when you bold, when you talk to a woman with an average or less than average level of confidence, like, hey, uh, Cynthia, um, would you like to like, you know, maybe come to my place on Friday, maybe? And maybe we could have drinks and watch a Netflix movie and then maybe, you know, possibly make out like afterwards, even have sex. And she says, hell no, Herbert, hell no. I'm not coming over your place and watching no Netflix movie and having no drinks with you, you sorry ass. And you're like, okay, okay, I didn't mean to like offend you and stuff. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And you walk away from that conversation with your tail between your legs. But I ain't never let no woman fade me like that, man. I ain't never let no woman fade me like that. I ain't never let no woman fade me like that. Where she feels like 
Not only did she reject me, but she feels like she defeated me in that conversation. I'm a competitive motherfucker, as most of y'all know. And that includes women. I'm ultra fucking competitive. I ain't gonna let no woman fade me like that. When I walk away from a conversation, even in, in the instances where I get rejected, I want the woman to be frustrated and irritated, not me. And that's what has happened most of the time. I can name many rejections I've had where even though I was the one who got rejected, it was the woman who walked away from the conversation all ruffled and irritated and flustered and frustrated. And I was walking away with a smirk on my face. I was walking away with a smirk on my face. So that's another component, man. I, well, I just mentioned a third uh being unfazed by rejection, man. That's part of it. It, it. Remember when I was talking about with the guy who was recommending the order of books you should read? And he said, he basically was talking about, he said, oh, he said, I think guys should read your book, No Free Attention, before they read Mo One or listen to the Mo One audiobook. And he said, the reason why is because no free attention does an excellent job of, of provoking men to examine their fear of rejection. He said, because if a man hasn't overcome his fear of rejection, he shouldn't even be trying to be more one. It's a waste of his time. And it's true. It's true. If you haven't overcome your fear of rejection, you, you shouldn't even, even be trying. That's why when I work with clients, that's the first thing I, I usually tackle. Like when I do consultations and coaching sessions, I would say that's usually, there are few exceptions here and there. But with most men, that's usually my step number one is helping a man overcome his fear of rejection. Yeah, if, if, if you're really phased, if, if rejection profoundly affects you in a negative way, you're never going to have success with more one. I've always said on frequent videos, I said, that's my number one strength as a seducer, as a verbal seducer. I don't give a fuck about rejection, man. I can have 10 women reject me in a row and wouldn't phase me not one bit, not one bit. I can have 10 women reject me back to back to back to back to back, wouldn't phase me in the least, could give a fuck. And I guarantee you at least half of them women related to what I said a few minutes ago would leave the conversation feeling irritated and frustrated, not me. Because I'm a bold, cocky motherfucker, man. I believe I'm the shit. Yeah, I said it. Quote me on it. When I talk to women, particularly when I was younger, even still to this day, but definitely when I was in my 20s and 30s, every woman I talked to, in my mind, I believe I was the shit. I was like handsome to God. <laughs> the arrogance of his username. That was my level of cockiness. And, and I don't want to say arrogance because I don't like that word. But that was my level of cockiness, man. I felt like whenever I talked to a woman that, hey, you're talking to a dude who's a motherfucker. You ain't talking to no average Joe Schmo type dude. You're talking to one of the baddest motherfuckers you're going to ever meet in your life. That's, I never actually would say that to a woman, but that was my underlying attitude when I would talk to women. Like, like again, yeah, Sharon, that's how I talked to her. This was a woman who was used to dating like millionaires and, and professional athletes and entertainment industry. I talked to her like, I am the baddest motherfucker you will ever meet in your life. I ain't saying everybody got to be super duper duper cocky. Maybe that doesn't fit with your personality, but you got to at minimum have an above average level of confidence. Confidence just simply means a combination of two things. I did a video on confidence. Confidence means... You have enough motivation to take action, number one. You have enough motivation to take the action to approach a woman, initiate a conversation with her, and speak your mind. And number two, when you do speak to a woman and express your desires, interests, and intentions, you have positive expectations that she's going to reciprocate. You don't know for a fact but at least that's your expectation is that she's going to reciprocate your desires, interests, and intentions. So to wrap it all up, Mo One is definitely representative of direct verbal game, but not all direct verbal game is representative of Mo One. I've seen guys call stuff Mo One 
Well, I'm like, that ain't mold. That wasn't mold one. In some cases, it was mold four. In other cases, it might not have been mold four, but it just wasn't mold one for one of the reasons I've already talked about. Here are the three main components. There might even be a few more than this, but here are what I call the three main components of mold one. Component number one is being upfront, specific, and straightforwardly honest. Keyword honest. Straightforwardly honest with women in a manner that is bold, I would say more specifically, verbally bold, unapologetic, and highly self assured. All the things I talked about. All the things I talked about in this live stream. That's the main component of Mo One. It's being upfront, specific, and straightforwardly honest with women in a manner that is verbally bold, unapologetic, and, and very confident and highly self assured. That's the main component of Mo One, but that's not the only component. A secondary component of Mo One is be, what I talk about in my book, I call it egotistical indifference. I say in Mo One, you got to reach a point of egotistical. What that simply means, that's a simple formal way of saying, you got to reach a point where rejection does not phase you. Criticisms from women don't phase you. Insults from women don't phase you. Harsh rejections don't phase you. You're able to laugh them off. That's a secondary component of Mo One. You got to get to the point where you're totally unfazed by women's harsh, subjective criticism, personal jabs, and opinionated insults, and their quick, straightforward, abrupt rejections. And then the third component specifically relates to when you're dealing with a wholesome pretender or an erotic hypocrite. Now, when you're dealing with, say, a reciprocator, a rejector, or a manipulative time waster, then only those first two components are important. Only those first two components are important. But this third component comes into play when you're dealing with wholesome pretenders and erotic hypocrites, and that would be developing and maintaining a certain level of charisma, persuasive charm, and seductive influence, what's commonly known as having a mouthpiece. And so you see in the bottom right, the bottom right, the three components, Mo one is the intersection of those three components. Mo one is the intersection of those three components. I'm the only dating coach who could give you Mo One advice. I would never say I'm the only dating coach who could give you direct communication advice. I would never say I'm the only dating coach who could give you direct communication advice. But specifically, Mo One direct verbal game advice, I say that on my video called Protect the Brand. I say that at the end. I say, I am the only person alive who could give you Mo One based direct verbal game advice. Anybody else who's trying to make you believe they could give you, tell them to put this where it don't shine. Quote me on the shit. Anybody who's a, a blatant copy got in mind trying to give you the impression they could give you more what? Tell them I said this. Real talk. Motherfuckers. Tell them I said it. Give me that number. I'll tell them directly. I ain't scared to say shit to nobody. Y'all know that. All these people fretting out here like they could get. I, I, I see one. There's at least one guy I could call out, but I'm not. But I did before. Y'all can go in my archives. I remember there was a guy on O'Shea was being interviewed by O'Shea Duke James. This was like two years ago or so. And he was talking about direct game versus indirect game. And instead of simply saying direct game and indirect game, he kept saying more one versus indirect game. And I got irritated listening to that. Even O'Shea was trying to correct him. He kept, O'Shea interjected like two or three times said, when you say Mo One, you, you, you know that's Alan Roger Curry's brand of direct game. Because he was describing Mo One like Mo One represented all forms of direct communication. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That's like saying Big Macs represent all double cheeseburgers. No, it don't. The big matter of fact, even at McDonald's, they have another burger called simply the double cheeseburger. They got a Big Mac and then they got another burger called simply the double cheeseburger. 
Like I started out with that analogy, man. A big, every Big Mac is representative of a double cheeseburger, but not all double cheeseburgers are representative of a McDonald's. Big, you can only get a Big Mac from McDonald's. You can only get more one based direct verbal game advice from Alan Roger Curry. The GOAT, the king of verbal seduction and kinky erotic dirty talk. The godfather of direct verbal game, knowledge, wisdom, insight, and advice. You guys have a great day. Talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I go, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, my king. Oh, you're the fucking king. Yes. 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 Oh. Oh. You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice. How seductive your intonations are. The vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice. How you could make her pussy so wet just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. The king. The king. The king. Um, I have to agree with you on the communication piece. Because I actually did take a session with uh, Alan Roger Curry. And he gave me a mm-hmm. line that I, that I did not think was going to work. And it worked. And I was like, what the, what the fuck? <laughs> oh my God. Oh man, he's the master. He's the master of the verbal yeah. seduction. He got that communication yeah. piece down pat. It really worked. Yeah. It was complete. It, it just simply works, and I just didn't think it was going to work at all. Some guys, have, some guys have a, some guys have natural handles. Some guys have a better natural shot, but you can always improve your shot. And sex is damn sure something you can fucking learn. But look, dude, you want to learn how to talk better? I'm hiring Alan Roger Curry to get my dirty talk game on because it's, it's always been something I want to get better. at. Verbal seduction, <laughs> man. I'm like clearly this guy is the Michael Jordan of seduction. Like, you know, come on now.